This meeting of the Board of Trustees is called to order at 6.04. We have a quorum with Carlos Bustillos, Richard Couder, Cruz Ochoa, Mike Rosales, and myself, uh, Sotero Ramirez. President Woodruff and Trustee Lucero are unable to attend this evening. Trustee Rosales, will you please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance and the moment of silence. Good evening, I'd like to welcome everybody to the March workshop. Let's get right to work. Dr. Latore, will you please lead us through the workshop this evening? Vice President Ramirez, members of the board, those in attendance, we'd like to begin this evening with an English language learner overview and presentation. At this time, I'd ask the presenters to come forward. Director of Academic Language Programs, Luisa Aguirre Baeza. And with her this evening is? Travis Monroy. Travis Monroy. Good evening. Uh, we are here to present our mandated Chapter 89 evaluation. It's a one year behind um, per the Chapter 89 mandate. So I'm going to turn it over to Travis Monroy, who's going to walk you through the entire process. All right, well, uh, good evening, everyone. Um, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at kind of, if you look at the logo that's on our screen here, uh, this is kind of uh, the symbol that we use, I guess, to, or the graphic, the visual, that we use to guide the work that we do in the bilingual department, the academic language programs department uh, here in the ESET ISD. Uh, so you see there's a four part, uh, pro our, there's four parts to our process uh, in which we, um, we do our planning, and then we do kind of our action, which we call it our do uh, phase, and then we check, which is our accountability, and we finish up with our target support, which is where we act. And then of course we repeat the process all over again. Uh, we're gonna start with the data, uh, some data from our 2018 STAR uh, that we're looking at here. Um, the data that you're looking at in the next few slides is just our current English language learners uh, in comparison to the English language learners in the state of Texas. As you skim through the slide that we're looking at here, you'll see that for the most part, uh, the English language learners in the SLED ISD outperformed the English language learners in the state of Texas uh, in the majority of our content areas and grade levels in grades three through eight. When we look at the high school uh, EOC rates, you'll see that um, the SLED Independent School District English language learners outperformed the Texas English language learners in all five end of course uh, tested areas. Continuing on uh, with the same data piece, our 2018 Star English Learner passing rates. Uh, this is kind of the regional look here in El Paso County. In the following slides, the Sled Independent School District English Language Learners are in the um, blue, <laughs> but there's three shades of blue, so this is kind of the medium shade, if you will. Um, you'll see in the English Language Arts and Reading here that we had the high, our English Language Learners had the highest star passing rate percentage in the county for English Language Arts and Reading. And on the following slide, we had the highest in mathematics as well. And the following slide, we had the highest in writing as well. And this is in the read in the county. Uh, as we go into science, you'll see that our English, our English language learners in science had the third highest score passing rates. And in social studies, we had the third highest passing rates as well. And there were two uh, districts that are not represented in this because their data was not reported. To summarize kind of our data review for the 2018, uh, spring 2018 STAR testing session, uh, we did have higher passing rates than the Texas English learners in most of our content areas and across all grade levels. Uh, we had the highest passing rates in El Paso County in reading, mathematics, and writing, and we experienced increases in most content areas for, when compared to the spring 2017 English language learner test performance. Uh, you've also seen this uh, data before as well, uh, but we did want to present um, kind of some of the things and highlight some of the things that we uh, that we noticed from our, in our 2018 uh, star performance as well. If you, as you're looking at this, the middle, co the column with some green in it, it's uh, headed, it's the column heading is ESLED ISD. The, where you see the green, this is our top, we, or those are the tested areas in which we had the top regional score 
um, across for El Paso County. Uh, but the column that we're most excited about, if you look at the change from 2017 column, those columns that have the yellow, or that are highlighted in yellow, uh, that shows the tested areas that we grew in our passing rates from the 2017 administration to 2018. Um, of other particular note, uh, a couple of things we wanted to point out. On the right-hand side, there again, you'll see the, um, the EOC in which we scored again the top scores in, in the region. Uh, and then in the left-hand chart, you'll see the, um, in our third and fourth grades, you'll see that we had the highest scores in our region. As we continue on through our presentation, we talk about some of the changes that we've made in our dual language program model over the last few years. Um, this is really encouraging for us because what we're, what we're noticing is that we're starting to cycle through kids now, or our kids who have been going through our current uh, dual language program model are ones who are now showing up in our third and fourth grade star data. And so, as you can see, you know, we may not have had the top scores in fifth, sixth, seventh grade, sixth, eighth grade here and there, but we believe that we're on the right track um, with our new dual language program uh, model as it exists today. Uh, so looking at that program structure, uh, we do have, of course, all of our elementary schools are participating, or they do have the dual language program um, at all elementary schools. And then there's a select number of middle schools and high schools that you see on the screen here in which we also uh, have dual language programs. Our model, when we're looking just specifically at the elementary model, uh, again, there's a focus on literacy in, in our dual language model. You'll see that by the end of second grade, we are wanting all of our students who are participating in our dual language program to be reading at grade level by the end of second grade in Spanish. Uh, if you look at the next column over in third grade, uh, by the end of third grade is when we are expecting all of our English language learners to be reading on grade level by the end of third grade. Of course, the, uh, our dual language program does continue on into the high school uh, our middle and high school grade levels. Um, this affords all of our students in the SLED ISD an equal opportunity to achieve the uh, bilingualism and biliteracy uh, per performance acknowledgement upon their graduation from high school. Looking at our ESL program in our middle and high school, uh, the first bullet here, this is not new to the 2018-2019 school year. Uh, we have always, uh, to be in compliance with state requirements, all middle school ESL students must be served by an ESL certified teacher in an ELR or English language arts course, regardless of years in US school, proficiency level of English or country of birth. Uh, what was new, effective in July of 2018, and effective at that time for the 18-19 school year, is that all high school ESL students um, required intensive instructional language support by an English and ESL certified teacher in an English language arts course, regardless of years in US schools or country of birth. And uh, you know, this was a change of, of course here for the entire state, uh, not just of course for us in the district, um, because previous to this, there was, there was a very select few uh, number of English language learners who had to have an ESL certified teacher for an English language arts course. Uh, pre previous to this school year, uh, teachers who were trained in shelter and instruction were also allowed to provide uh, English language arts instruction to our students. Uh, to assist our campuses um, with, our, with placement, proper placement in our, of our students in our ESL program, our district or our department has developed middle school placement guidelines that guide our middle school uh, administrators uh, in the placement of our students to ensure that our kids are getting the services and the support that they need as they work toward building their academic language and their academic knowledge and skills uh, within their classrooms. Similar, we've done the, similarly, we've done the same thing with our high school ESO program and developed placement guidelines that, um, that ensure that students are getting the support and the services they need based on their specific uh, language needs based on their English proficiency. So looking at our program as a whole, again, uh, we are focused in it with our dual language program with literacy development in both uh, Spanish and English. Uh, we are working to ensure that all of our kids in the district have an opportunity to achieve that uh, performance acknowledgement under House Bill 5 for bilingualism and biliteracy. Uh, we are working with our LPAC coordinators uh, to ensure that we're making data-informed decisions and that that process is also communicated down to our classroom teachers and so on and so forth. Um, we also ensure that we are using research-based resources in our ESL programs and our dual language programs and we provide training to support the model and to support best practices for English language learners on an annual basis. Looking at our team accountability, <clears throat> uh, for us, the big piece in accountability um, as, as a bilingual department is the TELPASS, which is the Texas English Language Proficiency Assessment System. Uh, this is used to assess the progress that limited English proficient students or English learners are making in learning the English language on an annual basis. 
The telepass is administered uh, in the spring of each school year to all LEP coded students in grades K through 12. Uh, while telepass wasn't new this past year, uh, there were two pretty significant changes in the uh, telepass administration in the spring of 2018. Uh, the first is that there, there was the introduction of the new online listening and speaking test. Um, this, what, what did, what this had, or previous to this year, the listening and speaking was rated holistically. Uh, so what that meant is teachers had a, a rubric that they would use to rate their students' oral language proficiency, their ability to listen and comprehend the English language, and their ability to speak the English language. Uh, new in the spring 2018, uh, the state developed um, an online test uh, in which students were uh, speaking into a computers and being recorded and so on and so forth. And then they were also having to listen to different prompts within the testing environment and respond appropriately and accordingly, okay? Uh, the second uh, change in the TELPASS program was the introduction of the revised online reading test. Uh, we've been testing TELPASS reading online for quite some time now, uh, but in 2018, they had revised the uh, TELPASS test at all grade levels. Looking at our data and, and how we performed, or actually how our English language learners performed in the 2018 TELPASS, what we're looking at here is, is uh, two sets of data. Uh, this is the number or percentage of students who reach the advanced and advanced high composite ratings. TELPASS is broken up into four different domains, the listening, speaking, reading, and writing domain. Uh, the composite rating is when we take all four uh, domains and put them together to arrive at this is a student's language proficiency. Uh, new to the 2018 TELPASS results with far the composite ratings is that um, each of the domains, the listening, speaking, reading, and writing were weighted equally. Uh, which is a significant change from years past when reading, telepass reading results dominated the uh, composite rating. So when we look at the ratings here, um, our students in, who are participating in our bilingual education program is on the right-hand side in the district, and on the left-hand side is your, um, student, your English language learners who participate in bilingual education programs in the state of Texas. If you'll see, uh, there are certain grade levels, especially in uh, first grade and second grade, where the number of students who reached advanced, high, advanced or advanced high on TELPASS in the, in the district fell below uh, and somewhat significantly, maybe 15, 20 percentage points, uh, the Texas, uh, or those, those students in Texas. But it's important to remember that our, through our program design, um, our students aren't, in the dual language program that we, admit, that we uh, use here in the district, our students are not really prepared to exit until after about six or seven years in the program. So as you work your way through the table, you'll see that by the time our students are in sixth grade, uh, that are, or our fifth and sixth grade, which is our students' sixth and seventh years in our program, but, uh, for the most part, you'll see that our students are achieving at a higher, or a higher percentage of our students are hitting the advanced, advanced high rating as compared to the state of Texas. Looking at, at our students in the middle and high schools who, who were participating in ESL programs, um, again, you'll see the same thing, that by the time we get to our ninth and 10th grade, um, all the way through high school, you'll see that our students uh, have, have achieved higher ratings or higher percentage of ratings, or those students hitting the advanced advanced high composite ratings when compared to the ESL students across the state of Texas. So looking at our accountability, um, one of the things we have focused on doing as a department is building capacity for language development. Uh, we've worked in great collaboration and partnership with our LPAC coordinators, uh, our system principals this school year, uh, to really make a big push for building capacity as an administrator and being able to oversee the, the, uh, the program and to be able to uh, provide guidance to our classroom teachers. And then we've worked really hard with our classroom teachers to build their capacity to help their students develop their language proficiency at an accelerated rate. Uh, it's important that our students uh, receive practice opportunities for all four linguistic domains on a daily basis. And uh, <clears throat> providing academic English language models is vital to our English learners. And our teachers and LPAC coordinators have really embraced the idea and have come to a tremendous understanding that they are the academic models in the classroom. That even though there may be students sitting to, to the right or students sitting to the left of the English language learner, the, um, the classroom teacher is the model uh, of, of academic English. Uh, I don't know about you all, but I have a 12-year-old and a 15-year-old monolingual English speakers, tremendous students, great grades, great star performances left and right, but their academic language doesn't, isn't, you know, it's not always what I would say is the model, uh, the model uh, of academic language, if you will, you know, and things of that sort. So 
Um, and then finally, we're looking at consistency and fidelity. Uh, that's essential to our ELL process, or progress, I'm sorry. Um, again, so I do wanna take a moment just to say our, our LPAC coordinators, you know, the collaboration that we have uh, experienced, I guess, with our administrators over the last year or two has really just been tremendous. Um, and we definitely look forward to continuing that working relationship. Finally, looking at our targeting support, target, uh, we're looking at a couple of things. Um, you know, all of our kids, and it's not just ours, it's, it's kids across all demographics, you know, they come with certain variables that we don't have any control over. Uh, some, of the, some of the examples that you see on the screen, uh, we do have kindergarten through second grade students who enroll with us, and they aren't even proficient in English nor Spanish. And so that presents certain challenges because, you know, a second language acquisition, students' proficiency in their native language positively impacts their ability to, uh, to develop uh, their English language proficiency or, I say, or whatever second language they're learning. Uh, our students come to us with issues with self-efficacy and the effect of filter impacts uh, their ability to acquire the language. Uh, we look at newcomers who come into a, or who enroll with us, uh, not only just in the early grades, but in all grade levels, and then of course throughout all points throughout the school year. Uh, we also look at our English language learners who are a product of our, of our inconsistencies. And I mentioned earlier when we're looking at our data um, that we're really excited because if you look at our third and fourth grade data, and these are the kids who have been with us from the beginning of this dual language program, um, that we believe we're heading in the right direction. And some, as these students who were uh, part of previous uh, bilingual programs in our district, as these kids continue to cycle out, um, we believe that we're able to raise the performance of not only the kids uh, who are coming through our programs, but the ones who are coming uh, in the future years again will continue to benefit from these programs. Uh, and then finally, uh, the intervention and support for English language learners beyond linguistics. Um, you saw that you know we are we do have um, requirements as far as English language arts and reading courses, but then there are inconsistencies sometimes uh, throughout the rest of the students' instructional program as far as language development. Uh, the factors that we can use to positively impact our English language learners, and again, we talked about the LPAC administrator as an advocate, and again, this is, you know, in the last year or two, uh, our LPAC coordinators uh, have really embraced that role as advocate for our students' um, academic and linguistic needs. Uh, we talk about fidelity to programs. Our program placement guidelines uh, help tremendously in making sure that kids are placed appropriately and that they get the services that they need and the support they need. Uh, we talked about collaboration. Of course, it's essential across all, you know, with all stakeholders in our district. Um, we can also look at our specific needs of our English language learners based on proficiency level. And again, this is something that our classroom teachers, our LPAC coordinators, with the support of our instructional support uh, specialists in our department, have really worked to hone in on the individual kid and treat the kid as an individual. And we believe that that approach is having positive effects on, on student performance because we're getting the students the support they need that's targeted to their uh, current pat or current spot, if you will, on this continuum of English language uh, acquisition. And then finally, uh, we've really stressed the need uh, to provide strong academic language models to our students and really focused on helping students um, not just become um, proficient in social English language, but also in, in uh, academic English language as well. Uh, this graphic here is just kind of a, a very brief generalized overview of what the support system looks like that our kids are receiving as they progress in our early grade levels, K through one, uh, into our middle school years, and then of course into the high school years. And then and finally in the last column, you're looking at our non-English language learners and the supports that they, uh, that they oh, I'm sorry, our English language learners who are participating in classes that are not designated as ESL classes or bilingual education classes, but there's still support systems built into those classes so that really, it's not just a English language acquisition happens in this 45 minute piece of, of this student's day, but really it's happening throughout the entirety of the student's uh, school day with us here in the district. Uh, here's a little bit more in depth um, presentation of the support that we are providing. Um, mixed in with this, with this slide, you're gonna see as you kind of scan through it, um, that we're providing a lot of support to our teachers uh, in, in terms of professional development that is just in time. It's professional development that we're responsive to our teachers' needs um, and we're responsive to needs that are communicated us to us through our LPAC coordinators to ensure that teachers are getting the training that they need to provide better services to our English language learners. Uh, you'll see down the road a really important piece, or down on the left-hand side, a really important piece is our monthly LPAC coordinator meetings uh, because the truth of it is if our kids aren't placed, you know, and the LPAC is responsible for placing our students and making sure that they are served appropriately, um, 
again, our LPAC coordinators have really worked really hard to make sure that our kids are where they need to be. And the work that we've done with them on a monthly basis to kind of make sure that we're monitoring that process uh, has paid off dividends, we believe. Uh, we are into our, the Alps SharePoint is a system that we use to share data with our with our campuses uh, that, that assistant principals have access to and then can disseminate that information down into down to their uh, classroom teachers. And then our instructional specialists have developed Google Classrooms uh, for our uh, teachers to, uh, to join into it. And, and that's kind of a, what we use to communicate with them on a day-to-day -day basis and make sure that our, our teachers are getting the supports that they need and the resources they need. Uh, looking at the student support, uh, a couple of highlights here. Uh, as our newcomer English language development course, this is the pilot year, this 18-19 this, uh, school year is the first year that we've implemented this class at the middle and high school levels. And um, we have used a, a program called DynEd in this classroom and we've seen tremendous results uh, or preliminary results as far as taking students who are enrolling with us with little to no English language proficiency and accelerating their, uh, their progress as we go through the school year. So we're really excited to see um, what that what those what that data tells us after a year. Finishing up our targeted support um, again, we're looking at working through those inherited factors to better support our, our English language learners. Uh, we're looking at supporting our teachers through research-based practices and programs that we're providing, and then we look to a continue. We're continually reviewing our program structures and data to make sure that the support we're providing, providing to our students matches their needs and their performance. And then finally, we're looking at supporting our English language learners across the content areas through sheltered instruction. All right, so that's our process. And, and of course, this is the work that we're doing as a department. Um, I do appreciate this will kind of conclude our presentation, uh, but I do appreciate the time. And then, of course, we're open to any questions. Great. Yes, sir. Mr. Uh, yes, on the la last slide, you said inherited inherited uh, factors what does that mean the inherited factors we were talking about are our thing are those variables that we can't control if you will that you know kids coming into us with different levels of proficiency in their native language different levels of okay. proficiency in their in the second language and things of that sort that we're just we're these are struggles that although we can't control them you know we're it's right. still our responsibility to work through them and make yeah, sure our kids get the service the, they need yes i understand that now i just couldn't understand when it's yes sir all right on the Back to your uh, data review. Yes, sir. I understand the first two slides, they're talking about percentages as compared to Texas. And uh, then the other slides where we're actually going, getting into the angu English language arts and reading, mathematics, and we're comparing across the yeah, ISDs across here, region. Yes, sir. Could we have um, some numbers on the population? What are you ac actually you're talking about? Because percentages to me are not clear cut. I'd rather have some numbers as to the population that you're talking about. Okay. Do you have that? Uh, I don't have it handy, uh, but I can tell you, uh, I know as far as our numbers, I know we have approximately 10,000, give or take. Well, English language I, I know that Isleta has uh, a, a big population of, of English language learners, and yes, I just sir. want to make that, because percentages to me, I mean, Clint could have 10, we could have, right. <laughs> you know, uh, right. percentages just don't mean that much. Okay. So could we get that? Uh, yeah. We can definitely um, work on that. I can yes. actually tell you off the top of my head, uh, this letter has one in four students that are English learners. Um, Socorro is one in five. El Paso uh, is at 28% or one in three. Um, although that runs counter to what typically happens because when you have a much higher EL population, it's usually coupled with a high uh, socioeconomically disadvantaged population and, and they're on polar opposites. So their socioeconomically disadvantaged student number is low, but their EL number is high. And that typically counters what, what happens. Um, uh, Clint has probably the highest number or the highest percentage of EL students. Uh, Sanelli and uh, some of the smaller school districts have high numbers, but smaller number right, of students, right. so they really focus on those students. But we can get it broken down for you by providing you with a taper report that actually gives you the number of students that are considered to be I just, I English just wanted to point learners. out what a big impact our programs are doing to a big population. Of Absolutely. The, I mean, it's percentages to me are not, I mean, they're good, but no, they, put actual numbers to them. I, I think we can, you know, 
raise our own flag and say, hey, we're doing a good job. Absolutely. This is what we're doing. We will okay. provide that uh, in your Friday packet this weekend. So on page 11, and this is just a suggestion because I was part of uh, another group that we never used um, generic words like most content area. I would like more specific uh, numbers as to what you're talking about, higher passing rates than Texas ELs in most content areas. Okay. It's actually Again, that's very ambiguous. It's uh, in reading or English language arts, reading, mathematics, um, and science. I think where we dip is writing and social studies. Well, if you would put that instead of most, that would definitely help me okay. understand because most to me can be understood on the on the on the star regional comparison ELs uh, I had a question you have two columns for Isleta but you only have uh, one single column for Socorro El Paso and state which one should I be looking for to compare across to them the one that the, you uh, serve on the board for I'm sorry which one the one you serve on the board for. So the yellow indicates. No, I know that, but you've got two columns there. Yes, I do. What, what the yellow column is telling you is how much growth they've experienced in a year. So at the third grade in reading, third graders have increased by 10 percentage points, one percentage point seven. So all of the yellow indicates that they're moving in a positive direction with the exception of writing, where you see a decline of one percent and a decline right. of four percent. No, I understood that. But, but what are the other columns for it? Uh, Socorro, El Paso, uh, and state, are they, are they? Why are we trying to make a comparison there too? Okay, we'll go back and see how they performed last year and tell you how much they improved in a year. Because I see 2017 star for the first 74%, and then I see across the board 77, 81, and 73. Right, we're 84 comparison? actually. <clears throat> because I think we did, if you look at the 2017 column, Yes. I think overall, uh, uh, compared to the state, we did pretty well. Yeah, the the columns for the other school districts and for Sleda, those that are um, highlighted in green are 2018 numbers. Right, I understood that, yeah, the approach. You wanna see how much they're growing relative to- No, I just wanted growing. to make sure that I understood how this was presented. Okay. Uh, because that first column was compared to the last three columns, right? No, no, no. The green column is being compared to the last three columns. Oh, okay. So we're doing even better then. Yeah. Yes. Okay. That's the one that I wanted to understand. Yes, sir. I understand. Okay. Okay, there's... Oh, uh, just for my own... Um, when you put uh, middle school placement guides and everything, either enlarge them or or something, because I try to read them for, it's just my nature and I, I couldn't see them. Okay. We'll include that on Friday as well, yeah. Mr. Ochoa. Okay, and I think the comparison ratings, you explained it, so I got an answer to that. One question is, what's an LPAC? Uh, the uh, the are the English language proficiency standards, and so what it is is uh, attached Oh, I'm sorry, LPAC. What does uh, it stand for? The LPAC is the Language Proficiency Assessment Committee. Okay. And so we're, every school uh, in the well, state of Texas yeah. is. I just couldn't find the, what that acronym oh, stood okay. for. Yeah. Uh, and the last one was inherited, so we got that. All right. Oh, I just had one quick question. Do you all track any of the numbers as far as, I know our students are doing really well across the board on STAR, but how many of them are graduating college ready, how successful they are on TSI, so that how many of them are still needing developmental classes once they get to college, if they go to college? Do we track any of that information? Because I know with our ELLs, that tends to be one of the biggest issues is once they get to college, they're having to take a lot of remedial developmental classes at EPCC or UTEP, so I think it would be nice to be able to track how many of them are graduating still needing those kind of things and how many of them are actually ready to enter a college level course. Mr. Kudir, we can get our area department to work on that. Awesome. And TSI results also would be a great way of being able to determine how many of them are passing TSI or meeting the benchmarks. 
So the only caution we'll, we'll look at uh, for you, the only caution we'll have is that once they lose the limited English proficient coding, then we lose that information in the TSI. And then um, limited English proficient is only in public education from K through 12. So after they graduate from high school, that code never follows them again. But we can definitely give you some tracking information and try to track down where those are going. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Was there any other questions? I'd just like to make a couple of comments. Uh, about two and a half years ago, Louisa and myself and uh, Mrs. O'Neill um, sat down and had a very long conversation. And uh, it was not a pleasant conversation mm -hmm. as far as the data we had to share and the issues we had to share and, and the things that we were doing in the district. And, um, um, but um, Mrs. O'Neill and Louisa, they took ownership of everything, good, bad, and, and the ugly. and. Um, they told me we have a plan and that if, if we follow the plan that our students can become that much more successful and be better prepared going into the future. And uh, it, it certainly seems like that. Uh, you know, attending the, uh, the uh, dual language showcase certainly uh, proved that. And I saw that bullet up there on, on the slide. Um, and then the other thing too is identifying individual student needs and, and trying to serve the student as an individual. I think that's huge, hugely important and I think the community needs to understand that, that none of our students, none of our children are ever in number. Uh, we work to serve them as individuals and I think that's important, I recognize that. So with that, I, I'd like to say thank you to the leadership here at Central Office uh, for helping us uh, define that vision and then uh, to the campuses, to the, and especially to our teachers out there who are just working at it day after day and hour after hour, uh, you know, and making those little gains, but they're huge gains in the long run. So uh, I hadn't forgotten, and, and, and that always, that conversation, that was a long afternoon, yeah. and, uh, but I, I always remember that conversation, and I've kind of carried that forward. So thank you very much, congratulations to the team. Thank you, appreciate it very much, thank you. All righty, thank you all for the time. Thank you. If I can get uh, Mr. Basuto and his team up, uh, we're gonna talk or continue our conversation, our narrative around uh, the new Riverside High School Career Center and how that's evolved and uh, some new developments uh, that uh, Principal Gurani and his team uh, would like the board to be uh, aware of and would love to have your feedback. Okay, good evening, Vice President Ramirez, Dr. La Torre, and board members. Um, we're here tonight to present phase two of the Career Center at Riverside. But before we begin, I wanna introduce members of the planning team. To my left, you have Mr. Gurani, uh, principal at, proud principal of Riverside High School. We have Ms. Ceci de la O, CTE instructional specialist, Ms. Christine Gleason, high school academics, and of course, Mr. Fernando Marquez, CTE director. Uh, the person not present here today is Mr. Chris G. He's out of town but he was also instrumental in this process. So let's discuss about what the prior presentation was. As you recall, back in the fall, about October-ish, we had a presentation where we discussed the first round of the phase for the Career Center, which dealt with these current programs offered at Riverside. And we focused on four things there. One, we looked at overhauling and revamping the current um, facilities and our instructional materials. Number two, we looked at aligning curriculum with higher ed. Number three, we looked at aligning with business industry for certification and internships. And lastly, we presented with you a rendering of our vision for the Career Center regarding the reconstruction of that area. Good evening. As you recall, we were uh, tasked with the endeavor of go big or go home as some of the words that, that you were giving. Uh, we're proud to announce this evening that we went big and we're the solid gold standard once we complete this. Uh, some of the new programs that we're looking at, you know, using the data, the market analysis data from our local, regional, and state sources and working with our business partners, we're proud to introduce new pathways in the area of aerospace and defense, expanding multimedia technologies, engineering and architecture, video game design and cyber technology, and energy technologies. 
Coupled with these new pathways is a new instructional approach that we've developed and will implement with these pathways, and that is something we're calling a cluster system. A cluster approach allows a student to take up to four strands or four related fields of study within each pathway, utilizing only two instructors. So utilizing the two instructors, our students are able to focus on up to four related fields of study. And we'll get into the details of that throughout their presentation. As you may know already, we offer one strand for one instructor currently. So this is a more revolutionary, more effective approach to uh, making sure our students get the information, the skills, and the certifications that they need for the workforce. Good evening, everyone. In this pathway, we envision our students to become professional pilots, perhaps future engineers in the areas of aviation, or working in many of the avi aviation technology fields. This academy will ex expose students to electronic labs, rocket building and launching developing satellites, designing model gliders and pilot drones, flying in our state-of-the-art flight simulators, or perhaps visit one of the flight or perhaps some sorry, perhaps perhaps have the opportunity to fly in an actual plane. Our students will have the opportunity to engage in a meaningful science, technology, engineering, and math activities to enjoy ignite the students' passion for space. They will explore the science behind the forces and physical properties of planes, rockets, and unmanned vehicles. Imagine giving our students all these opportunities while attending high school. This particular pathway of programs is study will not be only unique for our district, but it will be very unique for our region. We will be the only district in our, in our area to be able to offer this type of pathway opportunities related to aviation, rocketry, and drones. From the learning the basics of aviation, of making improvements in the aerospace industry, the Career Center will create a pipeline of industry and training to create post-secondary opportunities in the areas of STEM aligned with industry. In partnership with experienced educators, curriculum developers, and aviation experts, the Career Center will offer students practical experiences while they complete their high school education. We are excited to bring this program of study to the district to inspire students to pursue careers in the area of engineering and aviation. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. As the CT Workplace Learning Coordinator, my main focus is to connect education to business and industry. And we have been doing that consistently with several of our campuses, but more so with the Career Center at Riverside, especially as we have been approved as a P-TECH Academy, which aligns not only with dual credit, but also aligns with business and industry. Our industry partners are experts in the field that can work directly with our students and bring them real world learning experiences. We envision our partners to have three main roles. The first one is to collaborate with students and teachers in the classroom as presenters, as mentors and event judges. Number two, to offer our students internships job shadowing opportunities and apprenticeship opportunities as well as working with our teachers in ex externships so that our teachers can also stay current in the field. And third, to sit on our advisory board so that they can help us shape our curriculum and our programs as industry changes continue to occur. I will share current and potential industry partners with each of these pathways. For aerospace and defense, in addition to being exposed to these cutting edge uh, technologies, students will have opportunities to participate in work-based learning opportunities through major partners. We have Fort Bliss and White Sands Missile Range right in our backyard. So they would be one of our main partners that we will focus on. In addition, we can reach out to BEA Systems, I'm sorry, BAE Systems, Boeing, Southwest Airlines, and NASA, to name a few. We are currently working with NASA through our engineering strand. This next pathway, excuse my voice, is a current pathway that we have right now. Um, however, the opportunity exists for us to um, increase this offerability tremendously. So allow me please to talk you through a story to illustrate how important this program is. 
I taught dual credit and I also taught AP. So at the end of the year in May, I have a whole bunch of seniors who are hungry to graduate, ready to get out into the world, and really needed some hands-on activities to do when they were in my class. And so what I started doing with them was I asked them to visually represent anything that we read in the classroom throughout the entire year. Needless to say, most of them would either pick to do a PowerPoint presentation, but then I gradually started getting students who wanted to start recording things, making videos, singing songs. So two of the most memorable projects that I had was I had two students named Fred and Spud, it was his nickname, and they had a heavy metal band. And so they took one of the, so the poems that we had read in class, wrote the music, wrote all of the guitar pieces, the drum pieces, the bass pieces, used the lyrics and sang the song. Well, they couldn't present that in my class, so they had to videotape it. And they used one of those videotapes that you all might remember, hopefully you don't, but it's the ones with the little tiny tapes in there where if you make a mistake, you have to press stop, rewind, and start over. And so that was how they did their project. My other students um, were performing a scene from Macbeth, and they, it involved the witch's castle, I mean the witch's um, area, the cave that the witches lived in, and their cave consisted of spray-painted cardboard and a tent. And so if we were to take those students and transcend them to Riverside High School right now in this present age with this upgraded facility, those two boys that wrote the heavy metal song would be allowed to record that song in a state-of-the-art music studio with the teacher students helping my students to produce it. The students that created Macbeth, the witch's cave with the cardboard would also be allowed to videotape that on an infinity screen, which if you don't know what that is, it's like a higher tech version of a green screen, very similar to what they would experience in an actual movie production theater. So by the time students leave this pathway, they have audio technology and they'll go through all of these. They'll have music production skills, they'll have advanced video technology, movie technology, and be able to broadcast. So as Ms. Gleason said, with the state of the art facilities, we would be able to bring in new partners. We currently have uh, Channel 26 and KVIA, and with these facilities, we could expand to um, local organizations such as Soundstage 9, Beacon Hill, who currently works with Khalid, who is a local singer-songwriter, and Star City Studio Productions. In the future, we can even reach out to organizations in California and New York and just be able to work with them remotely. This pathway that we have right here is engineering and architecture. This one is the second most popular program that we have at Riverside. It's also the model p -Tech program for the state. Currently, we have uh, max capacity. We're hoping to double that with this expansion. 17 students are gonna graduate this year from this pathway, 33 juniors will be returning, and we currently have 69 students on the waiting list to get into this program. Um, this year, we are pleased to announce that 10 students are working in the civil engineering field. These students work in the field Monday through Thursday, and then they report back to their teacher on Friday so that they can debrief and talk about the work experience that they're, they're getting. Um, Mr. Torres, the teacher of record for these kids, has told us many times that um, the engineering firms are approaching him because our students wind up better prepared than the UTEP students because they have experience with the software and they're able to actually do the surveying rather than just the theory that the UTEP students are earning. Um, also, we have a great opportunity with this pathway as Mr. Gurani was talking about. We don't have to limit it to just engineering and architecture. We can add topographical surveying because now we have drones and rocketry. As I mentioned before, through our engineering pathway, Riverside students have uh, been able to participate with the University of Alabama at Huntsville through a NASA competition called Inspires. Students were tasked with, a de with designing a payload for NASA and the team took first place in their division. Because of that, they were invited to present at NASA headquarters in Washington, D.C. two summers ago. And as Ms. Gleason has mentioned, the architecture civil engineering is one of our more successful programs, and we are using it so that we can model the rest of our programs after it. Current industry partners include GRV Integrated Engineering, Lark Industries, Tropicana Homes, Bath Engineering, and several other engineering firms. One engineering firm from out of, out of town wanted to start a business in El Paso, 
and the student had graduated from the area and was familiar with our program. So he approached Mr. Torres, and because he wasn't ready to set up a physical building, he hired a couple of the students and had them work from home. He set them up with internet, set them up with the latest computer and software, and so these students were not only earning a, a decent living while they were working from home, but they were still continuing their high school education. So now for uh, last week, we also had CEA Engineering Group contact Mr. Torres, asking for students for their land surveying. And as we mentioned, because it's one of the more successful programs, we actually have businesses coming to us for students for this program, and that's what we envision for the rest of our programs. We are also working closely with uh, Marathon Petroleum. They recently made a generous donation and we were able to buy a $30,000 3D printer for this program. And as I understand, no other organization in El Paso has one of those, so we were the very first ones. Okay, video game design and cyber technology. This is cutting edge. So um, let me just give you some sobering uh, facts. Did you know that 125 million people daily play Minecraft? Every day, 125 million. And did you know that the conglomerate EA Sports is a $3.8 billion company in software design and gaming? And so this is where we wanna market um, for our students and make them an opportunity for them to excel. That would be first of its class, never been offered. In addition to that is we also wanna offer them a well-rounded experience in cybersecurity and web design. So essentially our students through this pathway would get three well-rounded experiences around gaming design, web design, and cybersecurity. Through cybersecurity, which he mentioned is one of the newest programs, we have partnered with Prudential Financial. And you may think of them as an insurance company. However, a big part of their business requires a lot of computer science and data mining. So they have uh, partnered with us and are going to be offering our students internships and job shadowing opportunities coming uh, next school year. We have also signed up with TEALS, which stands for Technology, Education, and Literacy in Schools, and it is a part of the Microsoft Philanthropies. Through this organization, they will be bringing in guest speakers within the industry to speak to our students on a regular basis on a variety of topics. New partners will include BioWare, which is a subsidiary of EA Sports for gaming, FBI for cybersecurity, and as I've mentioned, we're reaching out to Fort Bliss to work with them in several of these fields. Our energy technologies is by far our most aggressive and innovative cluster pathway. Here we're expanding on the electrical trades and solar technology pathway. As you know or may not know, we were the first in the nation and we still are the first in the nation to certify students at the high school le level in solar technology. But here we're expanding those programs by adding wind energy technologies and petroleum engineering. The experience we envision our students gaining from this energy cluster are the ability to work with, collect, store, wire, and share energy from different sources. This includes a study of the extraction of crude oil and natural gas from far below the Earth's surface. And with our partners at Marathon Oil, our students will study how crude oil is manufactured into liquefied petroleum, gasoline, kerosene, jet fuel, and diesel oils. Now, when we were tasked with go big or go home, we knew this was gonna come with a hefty price. And so, in front is the summary of, of cost. Instructional equipment will come in at four million, and this is to include all current programs plus the new proposed programs, construction and renovation costs at 9.5 million, with all other related costs totaling 15.5 million total. Again, we know it's a little bit more complicated than writing a check tonight, so we're open to questions, suggestions um, that you may have. Mr. Ochoa. Uh, as you know, um, I'm very strongly tied to CTE programs. Engineering, um, everything that you just presented. I feel very strong about it. I just wanna make sure that we're um, planning this carefully 
and considering everything. Um, one of the things that I saw in your presentation was that of um, the equipment. Now, flight simulators are not cheap. Correct. Do we have instructors for them? Part of the aerospace program will require two new instructors. Uh, two new instructors will have to have that kind of background. So these are pretty much tailored instructors that we just can't get yes. off. You yes, just can't train anybody. Same thing for the other one is um, video recorder, the video uh, studio. That takes uh, somebody that has been in the business. Actually, knows. for that one, we have a, a line of people who have expressed interest. Uh, they're already working in the industry. Oh. We have two people currently who are front runners. One is currently working for CNN in Washington. I like the civil engineering. I think we, we don't have enough civil engineers. My question is, and I'm, I'm very glad that you got the 3D printer, what are you gonna use it for? It mimics manufacturing. It allows our students to uh, design parts uh, at a much quicker and more efficient rate than a traditional 3D printer. So that, that printer, which is was $35,000, is one of three. Yeah. Uh, there's one in Dallas and then one in Oklahoma, and then uh, it mimics manufacturing reproduction. So you're going to have some kind of a mechanical engineering curriculum? It's embedded in their program. Okay, because that wasn't mentioned here, so, okay. How about, um, all right, there was another question. Oh, when you came forward to the board about several months ago, in the fall, yes. the cost was a little different, wasn't it? Yes. What it was, it was, it was, it was 9.2 million in the fall. Okay, and now it's 15.5. That's correct. Why? There's six additional programs that are either expanded or being designed brand new. Okay. So the additional cost comes from the additional uh, equipment and program being added. When, I, when you presented back then, um, I understood that construction was gonna be a, a new facility that was gonna be added on to what we have now. Is this not true or is this just renovation? No, that's incorrect. That, the presentation required us to remodel the existing facility. Okay, so it's mostly renovation. Correct. That we're gonna do. Yes. Uh, so do we have the, the capacity to incorporate all these programs in, in, as it is now? Currently, we would have to go through the renovation to incorporate uh, all these programs. Now, there's uh, a asbestos removal. We have asbestos down there? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And this is coming from our in-house, in uh, prior to Mr. O'Neill leaving his team, uh, giving us the estimates of the portions of the building that have yet to be uh, abated. Cybersecurity. Cybersecurity entails a lot of different aspects. It's Correct. not just uh, setting up your computer so it won't be um, compromised. Correct. What kind of, I know that those are hard to find because they get paid so well. Mm -hmm. So uh, what are your plans to bring in somebody that can? Actually, that's, that program, we've been blessed. We already have the instructor for the cybersecurity part. His name is Oscar Palomino. And he's cer certified? He is certified. And in, he in actually what? was uh, homegrown. He's an Isleta product. He came through our district service center as security uh, in the area of, uh, uh, I don't know what you call it. Where well, yeah. He did surveillance. Uh, and then throughout that time, he was getting his degree. Uh, yeah, and computer certified. certified. Yes. Is he computer certified? Yes, he is 100%. Okay, because uh, that would be something uh, yeah. that I would like to look at his the certifications for what he has achieved. Because it is a very challenging career. And like I say, they don't give it up that easily. Exactly. Because it pays highly more exactly. than the teachers pay. So, okay. Those are all my questions on that. Thank you, Mr. Ochoa. Mr. Rosales? First of all, I, first of all I, I'm very in, enthused with the fact that we're looking at a at, at programs that mean something. And I'm not saying that the other ones that were presented were not, but I think we're, 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 we're touching on the cutting edge of, of what's real out there. And I agree with what you're saying, Cruz, when, in terms of uh, the preparations is, is fundamental. If we don't set it up correctly, then there's no sense in doing it. But as I look at the investment, what are these numbers? They, 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 they total up to be 1.4 million investment right here on the left side of each of the sheets. Oh, in the booklet? Yeah, what, what does that mean? 
When you're looking into the original investment compared to what we have today, having to add more programs also requires more space, more simulators, more technology to, mm -hmm. more technology to bring to the career center. So in doing so, we also have to uh, move some of the current features that we have in the building and be able to find another home for them so we can make space for the current or, or incoming programs. So the extra $4 million, half of the money goes directly to the equipment because we have to start from, from scratch. It will be a brand new new process and the rest will go into having to build it into the infrastructure for them to be able to sustain the programs. So in essence, uh, you're looking at the 15 point, what is it up there? 15.5. So you'd be adding another six, uh, 1.4? No, no, it's embedded in the it's, it's, it's embedded with the, already with, with the cost. The initial cost. Hmm? That, that money is embedded in the initial cost. On the 15, it's yeah. embedded in there. That's why I wanted to see. If yes, Mr. Rosales. So basically, when we first presented back in fall, it was looking at current existing programs. And then yes, we were charged absolutely. with, hey, let's go big or go home. And so we wanted to be innovative. And we scoured through the state. And, uh, and some of these programs are offered but we're gonna do it better. Um, so for example, I saw an aviation model that kids were walking in, but they weren't utilizing the program as it should be. And so that aviation machine where kids, I mean, imagine this, look, look at the aerospace and engineering. They're gonna work on rockets, drone technology. They're gonna learn principles of aerospace and they're gonna actually have an opportunity to learn, to earn flight hours. So there's not, and so our vision was, we wanna offer a robust overall program. Um, currently what we saw in the models in, throughout the state they only focused on one pathway. And so a child pretty much was locked into that pathway and that was it. And so what we envisioned was because they're there for three to four hours, we were envisioning semester uh, opportunities where we would focus on rocketry one semester, the following semester, aerospace technology, then they would earn the aviation hours. So kids walk away with a robust overall experience and then they can make a more informed decision once they graduate as far as where they wanna go. Yeah. Yes, sir. We were very thoughtful and deliberate because you know it's it's easy to just drop them in there and say okay you're going to follow this one pathway but here they're going to be they're going to be experiencing in four areas. Uh, I, I I don't have any more questions. Cruz says I pass the word. Yeah, and the career pathways. Have you laid out exactly what the curriculum is going to be so they can get their STEM endorsement when they graduate? Yes, we have. Yes, we, yes, we have all these uh, current pathways with the new ones. We already have lined up the endorsements. They're going to be the students are going to be participating. Uh, we abide to the HB five uh, legislative uh, recommendations in terms of number of classes the students can take because the students are earning more than six hour credits that will meet HB five endorsements performance. Yeah, I know some of the courses offer one credit. Some of them offer two credits. All of these cl uh, courses that we're offering, they're for three hour courses. The students meet half a day, uh, every day in the morning and the afternoon. So at the end of the two year program, they're gonna be earning six hour credits from the high school level. So that's, that's plenty of them. That's more than enough to get their STEM endorsement. That's more than enough. Right. And that also helps us with our uh, accountability at the end of the, because they follow the pathway for, for STEM. Mm -hmm. That is correct. And we're gonna have how many counselors? It's in the works right now, we're looking into, we have a recommendation for uh, support. So depending on how many programs we can open, coming up the next school year, we'll have you. We're already working with HR for us to be able to have the proper number of uh, counselors and teachers working in the career center. Yeah, because I think the counselors are really important to get this program, not only get it started and keep it strong, but we need to reach out to the middle schools also and let those uh, students know what they're, um, opportunities are in, the, in those grade levels. So that way when they come already as ninth graders, they already have their, their pathway kind of selected for that. What, what it concerns the counselors, we're not only looking at just one particular counselor to be at the career center, but we're also looking into providing the same information opportunities in all the high schools. So counselors will get more involved with the, not only just again the career center, but it will be across the district and the areas of career and technical. So they have the necessary tools and information for them to be able to guide the students in the proper way. Okay, I just wanna make sure that we, we, we dot all our T's and we'll cross all our T's and dot all our I's and make sure that we have the program <coughs> up and running on the right path. Absolutely. I think it would be a, a disservice, I think it would be a disservice to uh, innovate 
or have such innovative programs and then not prepare our kids to take them. And so starting in the elementaries and throughout their middle school years, getting them ready and excited about being able to take these programs is essential. And that's where our counselor and support staff would come in. Um, making sure that when they enter high school, they understand how important it is to maintain their credits, in, which is one of the requirements uh, to be in these programs their, their junior and senior year. That's where we're losing a lot of kids. Currently we have almost 700 applications for our existing programs. Uh, which is a tremendous number. Unfortunately, once we start uh, evaluating these applications, we're gonna see that many of them are not eligible because of the lack of credit. And so it's, it's essential. It, it's, it's half the program to make sure that our kids are very well educated in what awaits them at the high school level. And from an HR perspective, after speaking with Mr. Marquez and, and Mr. Basurto, dependent on how many programs are approved, we're looking at one counselor at Riverside High School and one assistant principal just to oversee the career programs to ensure that there is the, the supervision and the guidance necessary. Uh, going back to what you actually just mentioned right now, given that credits are such a big important part of being able to get into CTE programs, do you feel that having so many new programs, you're going to be able to fill them up and use the, the facilities to their maximum if we approve every single program? Uh, I think that what, what's helping us is the nature of the programs that are being introduced attract a different student. Uh, right now we're over 100% uh, above where we were last year as far as applications. So every program will be at capacity. So I don't foresee that as being an issue. Um, what I do foresee is, uh, Second year rollover, not having enough space uh, in the programs for, for incoming kids. We really think that these programs are by themselves a hit in attracting students to, to pursue these fields. And, and this is once again, just only for Riverside students, right? That's no, the, this is a district-wide no, program. It's a district-wide, yes, so we, every- We take every... students from all, uh, okay. all corners of our, of our district. Oh, that's awesome, okay, thank you. Any other questions? Yes, sir. You know, the other day I was over at, uh, at um, uh, East Point, and it, it's it's amazing how I what I, I gave him a I wrote a we, I, I read a book to him, and in every class of the four or five that I attended, I asked each of them, each and every one of the students what they wanted to be when they wanted to grow up, and, and I can't believe one kid, believe it or not, said I want to be an aerospace engineer. <laughs> We're talking about second graders. I think it was either first or second graders. The the, the desire is there, and and through the counseling process, that can be begun to be exactly. put way back, way, way before they even get to be ninth graders or 10th graders. The fact that we have a, a machinery, a, a process already within ourselves. Right. And incidentally, it's not, it's not capped to uh, YISD, it's also all class <laughs> YISD that we would offer the programs to. I'm sorry, who's the, what was the other district? <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> no it'd be, it would be open to the entire city. That, that's what, uh, to me, it's very exciting. Yes. One of, the, one of the avenues we use to, to inform our students currently, for example, this Friday, our, our uh, career center programs will be presenting at Presa for their career day. So we've done uh, career days throughout our district, where we're, wherever we're invited uh, or wherever I can get in, so that kids are introduced to these programs that are currently existing, and when they're introduced to the new programs, obviously, it's just that much more effective. Yeah, I know phase one was, was great. I think you guys did a great job. Where's the I think you guys did a great job with phase one. You know, bringing on Ceci has been a, a blessing, obviously, bringing on those uh, uh, collaborations with the industry. I, I really do believe that phase two needs to add a counselor to, to, our, to our system down there, because we do need that. I know, Danny, I don't know if you can elaborate on the success on finally educating our principals throughout YSD on, on, on CTE and how many kids we got to come to CTE. Can you elaborate on once, sure. once we did that or once you guys did that, how many kids you were able to get, which high schools were able to benefit from CTE? Can you elaborate on right. that? We, we've done a couple of activities to to enlighten our colleagues throughout the district. One was we hosted all district counselors, uh, secondary counselors at our campus, giving them a tour, explaining how 
coming to the Career Center does not reduce their enrollment. Those kids who come from any other high school are still coded to those high schools. We just serve them in our pathways. We also brought in all the principals and explained the same thing. Let them see with their own eyes what uh, opportunities lay in front of their students. One of the biggest turnarounds, for example, is at Hanks High School, where in previous years we were getting 20 to 30 applications uh, for all our programs. Uh, this year, they're almost at 200 applications. So again, it was just a notion of educating our students in what is available within our district. Again, this is not just a Riverside program. It is housed at Riverside, but it serves all students from within our district. Also, um, Ceci, I don't know if you know Netflix and Facebook have uh, established residency in Albuquerque, so I don't think you have to go as far as California to get that uh, through the video. Um, touched on enrollment, and that was it. I just uh, applaud you guys, and hopefully phase two we can get that, that counselor. And we, we're gonna start going after eighth graders, like you said, yes. eighth graders That's I think crucial. Is, is the crucial point. Yes. Okay. It's crucial that as they're winding up their, their middle school years in preparation for high school, right. and again, it's whatever high school they, they choose to attend within our district, that they know that these programs are afforded to them yeah. as a junior. So they have to do their parts as ninth and 10th graders to accumulate the proper amount of credit. And I can attest to that. I didn't go to college right away and I, I chose an industry and you know, we, we can, we can definitely help a lot of kids through industry. Also, Danny and I, or Danny and, and his team, and I have, uh, lo I'm looking forward to the signing day that we're gonna have mm -hmm. at the end. Um, I don't know if you wanna elaborate on that too. We, we felt it important that students who go in the industry feel the same type of accolades or receive the same type of accolades and enthusiasm and recognition as our athletes who sign with colleges. So we've planned a signing day for those individuals who have uh, received internships or pay, uh, paid internships uh, and will be going into the workforce. I think it's just a strong motivator for them, their families, and for future students who, who will witness these type of signing. Any other questions? Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. So we've talked about this. Where are we now? What, what's well, the, the next step, step is in your hands to give us the green light with moving forward with continued talks with architects, with uh, HR and the hiring, with the development and implementation of the programs. Uh, I, I mean, I, I said it in jest, I know it's a little bit more complicated than writing a check, but what it boils down to now is, is taking the next step in uh, looking for ways to fund this uh, endeavor. I think the, um, programmatically, I think the district can accommodate uh, the program. I think we've got uh, to have discussions around uh, the construction and renovation piece, the nine and a half, $10 million investment. We certainly have options. Um, some would be premature to discuss this evening. Um, there could be also some kind of a hybrid where we ask for support uh, from our community and then the district picks up uh, a sizable percentage uh, of the investment. Uh, but it really comes down to finances and, and how we secure the revenue from multiple sources or from one major source. Just for the record, I have to say, what do you think, right? What I think about the program? Yeah, can you repeat? Can you repeat it? No, no, I'm just kidding. No, I my microphone was off, so they asked me to ask you the question again. You just so, took me back about yeah. three years. <laughs> Did you just say for the record? For the record. <laughs> just scared the hell out of me. Uh, <laughs> Wow. I know what else to say. Hard question. Deja vu. I turned well, pale. <laughs> um, I think in terms of the instructional equipment, uh, the program allowance, soft cost, uh, you know, the abatement, uh, all of that, I think uh, we can accommodate uh, in our current operating budget. We're also waiting to see what materializes uh, at the end of the legislative session. There may be some additional revenue, uh, especially relative to CTE, that could be redirected to support a program. I, I want to commend them. They've done an outstanding job of taking it to the next level. Uh, they've really stepped it up, and with that comes increased 
cost. Um, the renovation, remodernization um, is the gold standard at about uh, $10 million. Uh, I'd like to go out and see whether or not I can secure that later this year. But if I can't, then we may value engineer it so that we can accommodate the programs without necessarily having to have the brand new state-of-the-art facility immediately with some kind of a timeline that would allow us to stage the remodernization and construction in over time. But, uh, and I know that, like I said, it's probably too early and premature to talk about um, securing the entire $10 million $12 million price tag right now, but we'll be coming to you and sharing some information that our program manager uh, has completed uh, for future considerations in the district relative to facilities and planning. And uh, if we can take care of that big piece over the next year, year and a half, then I think the rest of it will fall in place. You wanted a hard yes. Um. I'm good with what you said. <laughs> For, For the, the record. record. The record. <laughs> so that's recorded. I won't let you down. <laughs> yeah. uh, one last that comment. I, 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 <laughs> you know, I, I think, I, and this is my feeling, I, I feel that there, within this community, there, there's one or two organizations that are very interested in, in, in evolving and, and bringing our students, whether, where, no, it doesn't make any difference whether, as long as they're from El Paso, they're very interested in, if getting our, our students to the, these levels of potential of employment or sh preparation, shall I say, and it would be it would be very interesting. Um, well, not interesting. I would like to have an aggressive approach for these people are local, so that they can become partners in in, in this endeavor, because we're in the cutting edge of things that I hadn't even thought of. And I appreciate and I, I thank you guys for the hard work that you've done. Okay. Thank you. Okay, we've arrived at that uh, item in the agenda where if the board pleases, there are questions, concerns relative to Ms. Champagne. Who wants a timeout? If you would like to do that, sir. Well, let's take a, go ahead and take a 10 minute break.
28. Champagne, if you'll come forward, give the board an opportunity to ask any questions, express any concerns relative to your last uh, audit report. Good evening, everybody. Is there any question I can answer? <laughs> Mr. Ochoa. Okay, Champagne. Yes, sir. I thought we talked about you color coding or only see blue. Um, that one, it's a project tracking, project track, a coding for project tracking, that spreadsheet that you guys got? Yes, I know. Is, uh, uh, if there was any status change from previous monthly report and it's in blue. Okay. All right, the other question was, I know that you have like in, in this uh, project tracking. Yes. You have FY group, project, division name, and all that. When can't you put all the elementaries together, all the academics together, operations, um, instead of, because I have a hard time I'm looking at academics, then I jump to elementary, then I go to middle schools, and then I go to operations and finance. Can we, um, can we put them together? Yes, I can sort it different way. That way, if I'm following elementary, I can just do elementary real quick. If okay. I do academics, I can do academics real quick. Then okay. I can look at the... For now, it's sorted on the second column, project number. Well, I don't care about project numbers. I care about having them I'm sorry, I, I didn't mean to say that, like, but uh, I just want them to be clumped together so I can, if I'm looking at elementary, I can look at them all in one time. Okay. And then I've, um, because it, it kind of breaks my train of thought when I'm looking okay. at this. I'm, I'm focusing on elementary, then I'm all operations, and I'm doing finance, and then I'm doing other th facilities and construction. So uh, if we could have them, uh, uh, group together. Okay. That would make it a lot easier on me. I don't know about you guys, but at, at least to follow what what you're uh, placing here. How about I do it with a division by division operations all together? Well, that's what I'm saying by division operation. And operation <laughs> elementary is all together, and middle school, high yeah. schools by th that kind of order. That way, it'll keep my train of thought. It's like I'm looking at the elementary, then I'm looking because they all have different aspects as to what what you're looking at. And okay. How about a hotline call lock? Do you need me to sort it differently, or this is okay? The what? The hotline. The hotline, what about it? The next spreadsheet. No, the hotline's okay. Please, no, please. Please. Oh, that, uh, let's see. That no, one that's, is in that's order. That's not too, oh yeah, there was one, and. and on uh, item subject matter number four and five. Yes. And then you had the conclusions. Um, are these the conclusions for both four and five or? The yes, because those two are for the same, well, same matter. I know, but it, it, I would rather have you put the conclusion separately because that, that dealt with two different uh, uh, situations. Yes. You okay, understand? sure. One was with uh, um, attitude, the other one was being, um, what's the right word for that? Personal use of stuff. Okay. 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 I'll so uh, those I feel that should be uh, separated okay. and sure. not clumped together because that also, also uh, on this uh, not getting paid. Mm hmm. Uh, I know you've been looking to it, and I, I, I support that because uh, we don't want to get um, called on that. But uh, the other stuff, prevailing wages, prevailing wages, and so a lot of it was that. And that's on the hotline, or is that? No, that's not the hotline. Yeah, it is the hotline. But other than that, that was just it that... Um,
I think that's all I had for you was just to keep your color coding okay. across the board and make it a lot easier for me to follow what you're trying to, to information that you're trying to give us. Okay, so on the project tracking, do you need me to color more? Because for now, is if it's uh, in, in blue, meaning it's a new change compared to last month's uh, status. Yeah. So for example, last month maybe it was in planning, and this month we issued an audit report, then it would be in blue. Uh, blue, it says uh, subject matter resolution, and there's no conclusion yet, right? Which one are we talking about? The project tracking. Oh. Highline, we're okay, right? Highline, we're okay. Okay, I got it. So the project tracking at Highline, I'm trying to make a list so it's easier for you to know where our work progress is, how many projects we're doing, and a very brief summary about each project. So the, the project tracking, I try to be as brief as possible so it doesn't get too long. Well, sometimes brief makes it too, too brief. I'd just rather have it, the information there, but placed in more orderly fashion so I can follow it. Okay. Instead of jumping around. Okay, so, so in this project tracking, the coding, it's not like audit report. I understand that. Right, understand only that. one simple coding. If it's a new status, then it's blue. It's blue, okay. If not, then it's the same as last month. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah, that was it. And then if you have, getting back to the hotline, please uh, have a conclusion for each one of them instead of trying to lump them together. Okay, and I will do it. And when it's blank means it's not, there's no conclusion yet when right. it's blank. Yeah, I understand, I, I read that. Other than that, thank you for your job, for your hard work. Thank you. We appreciate it. Thank you. Anybody else, any question? Any other questions? Thank you, Ms. Champagne. Thank you. We will now discuss agenda items as listed in the posted notice of regular meeting of SLEDA ISD Board of Trustees for March 13, 2019 and related recommended motions with the superintendent and executive cabinet and received responses to questions and or requests for additional information to the superintendent in preparation for deliberation and action on said items at the March 13, 2019 regular Board of Trustees meeting. We'll go ahead and get started with the agenda review. I'm sorry, good. Sure, we'll go ahead and get started with the agenda review. Number one on the consent, Board of Trustees workshop and board meeting, February 6, 2019, 6 p.m. Number two, monthly financial update for January 2019. Number three, approval of award of YISD solicitation number 219019 RFP, fire alarm intrusion and PA systems, products, goods, materials, supplies, tools, and services. I, I have a question on that. Yes, sir. Is this $1 million, can somebody help me here? Is this $1 million gonna be split in the three entities, which is advanced alarm, l, &L uh, speed systems, or special systems in MSC? We do this annually, so it's the budget that's been established to purchase or procure. So any, any one of these three any would be them, any used? Any combination okay. of them, just depending so it's on the it's not a specific, needs. okay. That's all I need to find. Yes, sir. Thank you. Was there any other questions? Number four, 2019-2020 approval of certification of instructional materials for Proclamation 2019, State Instructional Materials in English Language Arts and Reading, ELAR, K through eight and Spanish language arts, SLAR K through five. Number five, approval of award of YSD contract number 20190149 with Sol Ross State University. Go to item nine, which is the policy action items. Um, please note that all matters listed under the policy action item can be considered by the Board of Trustees to be enacted by one motion, uh, depending on what the Board wants to do on uh, Wednesday night. Number one, policy BJA local, 
superintendent, qualifications and duties. Number two, policy CCG local, local revenue sources at the Lorem taxes. Number three, policy CCJGA, local new ad valorem taxes, exemptions, and payments. Number four, policy CH, local purchase and acquisitions. Yes, sir. I just want a clarification of what this actually entails. What is uh, that? Can anybody explain to me? Certainly. I thought Ms. Lipu was going to do it. Was um, this is one where um, the action that was approved that the Islata specific language, there was in December you all approved allowing the superintendent to uh, make the decision as to the methodology of construction. Uh, uh, for example, a construction manager at risk, a CS uh, construction uh, uh, field proposal, that sort of thing. That's a decision you made to change the policy. You made that decision in December. TASB did not yet incorporate it into the policy manual because it knew it was going to recommend some changes to CH um, in coming out with the update 112, so it's just making them at the same time. So you'll see TASB language and our language, and both are getting put in to the so are they working hand in hand? Are they similar or is that? Uh... No. The language that Hasby was recommending is pretty perfunctory. It's, um, it was just making a note to also look, if you're using federal money, to look at another policy. It didn't want to give the impression that it, if you were using federal pro money, this was the only policy. So what all that Tasby was doing was making a note to say, please also look, look at this at policy for federal money. Okay. Any other questions? Item five, policy CQ, local technology resources. Number six. No. Oh. Sorry, sir. Number five. Yes, sir. Uh, I don't know if anybody can answer this. Uh, the state allows a district to accept electronic signatures that comply with the rules adopted by the board. Now, these rules for electronic signatures, are they binding? Mm -hmm. Yes, under policy. All right. Um, binding between what entities? Um, if I sent you a document and I electronically put a signature in, is that? Yes. The thing is that, uh, Usually, it's uh, authentication requires two forms of authentication for electronic signatures in order to confirm that the person signing that document or that statement is the person. Uh, that way, they can't be compromised by somebody. Because in our case, I, I don't know about you, but my my email and everything can be easily compromised by my signature. So I don't want somebody, uh, if I put a document out, somebody puts a document out with my electronic signature and saying, that, oh, well, you signed it. Well, I, I just think that we should have another form of authentication, um, two-factor of uh, authentication on that, if it's gonna be binding. And there are certain ways to do that. Right now, it's just our password. And so would you like to pull policy CQ and suspend it and have us go back and take a look at it and bring it back at a later date? Please do so. Uh, I just don't want it to be binding and then uh, even for you yourself to send something else and then say, well, you put your signature on it. And if it's only password, I think it's too weak for us to use this. Depending on the, on the, on the, um, how uh, important it is that we're signing, even if we're finance or anything like that. It's, we just want to make sure that the person signing it is the person um, that's responsible. Two-factor authentication, is, it's a little harder to, to break than just a password. That's, that was my only concern about that one. Okay, so we'll go ahead and pull item number five, policy CQ. 
Was there any other comments on that uh, policy? I just want to, did you, did you have a chance to read the disclaimer of liability portion it, of that? What is it? Can you read it to me? No, it's too lengthy. I'm going to let you read it. <laughs> oh. I just don't want to be bound. Well, it says uh, the district makes no warranties of any kind, either expressed or implied, that the system functions or services provided by or through the district's technology resources will be error free or without defect. The district will not be responsible for any loss or damage users may, su may suffer, including but not intended or limited to loss of data, interruptions of service. The district shall not be responsible for ensuring availability of the district's technology resources, uh, accuracy, or quality of the information obtained through the stored system. The district will not be responsible for financial obligations arising from the authorized or unauthorized use of the system. It will have no liability or responsibility to students, or parents, employees, or, or guests. Well, I understand that. Kind of touches on what you're saying, I know. Well, kind of, but I, I, I just want to know to what extent these uh, signatures are going to be used, and um, if there's any possible implications that it could be misused, and what, and like you say, the liabilities might not be there, but uh, or it, I just want to make sure before we sign off on this that we are clear on this situation. I would just like to make a comment on that. Just uh, where I've seen electronic signatures used, it just, it there's already something in place that says that this person is an employee or this person's a vendor, well, this person's whatever. True. And, well, uh, but you have other, um, you have other procedures, you have other policies in place that, especially when you're talking about generating, uh, you know, payment or that sort of thing. You well, not only payment, but even um, uh, emails between us or anything like that. With they could be somebody could write an email and put your name on it, and then you have a hard time disclaiming that it was from you. I agree. I mean, it was it was misused. I'm just I'm just trying to protect us from any misinformation that might might be spread out, especially when they say electronic signatures. Even though you read the liability, but uh, in most cases, it's like, hey, you signed off on it. The, I just want to, uh, somebody to look at it and give me clear-cut uh, information on it before we sign off on it. At least I sign off on it. Yes, sir. Any other comments? Okay, item six, policy CS local, facility standards deleted. Policy seven, policy CV, local, facilities, construction. Item eight, policy DCD, local, employment practices, term contracts. You can answer that one. Can, can you um, explain that one to me? What it is, is it, it just differentiates the type of contracts and who can be under a Chapter 21 contract. There's certain personnel that are required by law, which is our principals, assistant principals, teachers. However, when employees come to central office, the term contract is no longer required. Any other questions? Item 9, policy DH local, employee standards of conduct. Item 10, policy DIA local, employee welfare, freedom from discrimination, harassment, and retaliation. Item 11, policy EHDC local, alternative methods for earning credit, credit by examination without prior instruction. Yes, sir. Yes, um, on this one, um, um, they can earn credit with, uh, by examination without prior instruction. Is this something that I know that in the, well, not, how has it been implemented so we can make sure that it's not misused? So Mr. Cruz, how are you? Good, good. <clears throat> good, good. Well, the way it works is a student has to request the exam and um, it's obviously done online and it's submitted and then we get the results back. And so that's the way, and we don't typically have a lot of students who take credit by exam. Um, there, aren't, there aren't that many. 
And these examinations are from UT Austin? Yes, Texas, Texas Tech and Tech. UT, yes. So they're already pretty standard. Correct, and which is why you don't need an audit process because they, we use their audit. Okay, That's and they're being, when they're doing this testing, they're being monitored and all that? Correct. Okay, Correct. I just yes. want to make sure that we have um, assurance that it's being handled properly and not misused in any way. No, these are, these are for credit, so absolutely. Okay. I think we need to bifurcate when you look at policies. Policies don't speak to the process. Policies speak to the requirement, whether or not we're implementing the policy or supporting the policy is a separate and distinct conversation because there are over a thousand districts. The policy applies to all thousand, but the way that we handle it in our district could be different than 999 other districts. So one is policy, the other is administrative. So the policy is the what shall happen. What we do is the how it will happen. Yeah, well on the end, there at the end of the program, uh, it says that exam examinations to all grades K to 12 and adopts the provider's audit process. Correct. So that's- But the board adopts policy, we decide how we handle it as administrators. Any other questions? Item 12, policy FMA, local, student activities, school-sponsored publication. On, on this, uh, no, it's only because of, of what happened before that uh, a student publication kind of misrepresented uh, the district and uh, there was a little bit of turmoil over that. Um, I just wanna make sure that we have complete, um, I'm gonna say, uh, we can see or look at this before it's being public, uh, provided a, as a publication. So we have the, again, so we can protect the district and ourselves from anything that could be misinterpreted. Am I right, Dr. Delotto? No, again, you're being asked to consider the policy. The policy, yes. The what, the how we do it sits with the administrators. So how are we gonna do it? The way we've always done it. I just want this for the record. Understood. <laughs> Understood. Thank you. Any other questions? No. Nope. Item 13, policy FNG, local, students' rights and responsibilities, student and parent complaints, grievances. Item 14, policy GF, local, public complaints. Why, why is the rationale used twice? If I could, this was something where um, this is about people who are barred from or ejected from district facilities. And so there are, it depends on whether you're a parent and student or whether you're a member of the public. So those fall under different grievance processes. The statute 37105 says that the TEA will adopt rules regarding appeal to the board. TEA has now adopted rules, and so we are referencing those rules, that rule, in each of the places where it comes up. So it comes up, that same rule, about 90 days to get directly in front of the board, applies to those different grievance processes. That's why the same rationale is in each one of those So we're policies. talking about the appeals. I'm sorry? The appeals uh, policy. Yes, so the, the rule from TEA applies to both of those different policies. So it's the same rationale. There's actually three. Three of them. Yeah. Oh, both three. <laughs> so 13, 14, and 15 are all interrelated. Mm -hmm. You okay, Mr. Rico? Okay, any other questions? All right, 15, policy GKA local, community relations, conduct on school premises. Item 16, policy GKB local, community relations, advertising and fundraising. That concludes the policy items, uh, our action items. Item one, order of cancellation of election for single member district two and four.
Item two, ratification of award of amendment number 10 to ISD contract, contract number 2016318 with MNK Architects. Do we have any other comments or questions before we adjourn? Have a nice evening. Hey, we're adjourned.